history has lied to you about Cleopatra. For 2,000 years, we have been sold the image of a seductress, a woman of unparalleled beauty who brought the Roman Empire to its knees. But that image is likely a mask, while archaeologists are currently digging 40 feet beneath the Egyptian coast. A different kind of excavation has already taken place in the laboratory. New DNA analysis and modern forensic reconstructions suggest that the last pharaoh wasn't a goddess. She may have been a genetic time bomb. The reality of Cleopatra's biology is far more terrifying than the romantic myths. It seems her greatest battle wasn't against the legions of Rome, but against the DNA collapsing inside her own body. To understand why, we have to treat history not as a story, but as a crime scene. And the first piece of evidence has just been uncovered. Most experts will tell you Cleopatra is gone, lost forever, under the tides of Alexandria. But for the last 20 years, Kathleen Martinez, a criminal lawyer turned archaeologist, has operated on a different theory. She profiled Cleopatra's death like a cold case homicide. Her conclusion was that Cleopatra wouldn't be found in the city where she was humiliated, but in a sanctuary where she could be eternal. Martinez pointed her team to Taposeris Magna, a crumbling temple 30 miles west of Alexandria. The academic world was skeptical, but in 2022, the ground proved her right. Her team smashed through the limestone bedrock and found a geometric miracle. It was a tunnel, six feet high and nearly a mile long, submerged in mud and water, heading straight out toward the Mediterranean Sea. You don't tunnel 40 feet underground into unstable rock for a minor priest. This was an engineering masterpiece, a hidden highway designed to transport something or someone of immense value away from prying eyes. Martinez believes this tunnel is the front door to the most sought after tomb in history. And the evidence inside the temple supports this. They found 16 rock-cut tombs containing mummies. But when they looked into the crumbling mouths of the dead, they saw the glitter of gold. These mummies were buried with golden tongues, amulets designed to let them speak directly to Osiris, the lord of the underworld. These weren't commoners. This was a royal court, buried in waiting. And if the courtiers are here, the queen is close. But while Martinez digs for the body, we don't actually need to find Cleopatra's bones to unlock her genetic code. We thought we had found a shortcut. We thought we could see Cleopatra's face by looking at the sister she murdered. Cleopatra's rise to power was bloody. Her biggest threat was her younger sister, Arsino IV. Arsino was a warrior who fought against Julius Caesar, was captured, and eventually exiled to the Temple of Artemis in Ephesus. But exile wasn't enough for Cleopatra. In 41 BCE, on her orders, Mark Antony had Arsino dragged from the temple and slaughtered. It was a brutal crime, but it gave historians a specific location. In the 1900s, archaeologists in Ephesus found a unique octagonal tomb containing a skeleton. For decades, the world believed this was Arsinoe. This skeleton became the center of a massive controversy. Earlier measurements suggested the skull had African characteristics, leading to the global debate about Cleopatra's race. If her sister was mixed race, Cleopatra was too. This skeleton was the only biological anchor we had to the truth. But science has a way of ruining a good story. In a 2025 study, researchers from the University of Vienna utilized micro CT scans to analyze the petrous bone of the skull, the dense bone that protects the inner ear and preserves DNA. They expected to find the genetic markers of a Ptolemaic princess. Instead, they found a Y chromosome. The skeleton isn't Arsino. It isn't a woman at all. It is a boy, roughly 14 years old. And he wasn't just the wrong gender. He was a medical tragedy. The scans revealed severe deformities. His jaw was stunted, his skull asymmetrical. He suffered from developmental disorders that would have made life agonizing. This discovery shattered the Arsinoe theory, but it inadvertently opened a door to a much darker truth. The boy in the tomb might not be Cleopatra's sister, but his deformities point to the exact same curse that was hunting the queen. The boy's twisted jaw is a hallmark of inbreeding, and if you want to know what Cleopatra really looked like, you don't need a portrait. You need to look at her family tree. The Ptolemies were a Greek dynasty that refused to dilute their blood. They adopted the pharaonic custom of incest to keep power within the family. They didn't just marry cousins, they married full siblings. Cleopatra's parents were likely brother and sister. Her grandparents were likely uncle and niece. The family was a closed biological loop. Geneticists estimate Cleopatra was born with a coefficient of inbreeding of over 45%. To put that in perspective, the child of two first cousins has a coefficient of about 6%. We have seen what this level of incest does to human beings. 
the Habsburg royals of Spain practiced similar intermarriage. The result was Charles II, a king whose jaw was so deformed he couldn't chew, and whose autopsy claimed his head was full of water and his heart was the size of a peppercorn. Biologically, Cleopatra should have been a disaster. She should have had the cognitive failures and physical deformities of that boy found in the Ephesus tomb. And yet history tells us she was brilliant. She spoke nine languages. She commanded armies. She charmed the most powerful men in Rome. This creates the Cleopatra paradox. Was she a genetic miracle who defied the odds? Or have we been missing the symptoms of her suffering all along? Modern medical anthropologists are now looking at the historical Descriptions of her ancestors and the diagnosis is grim. Her great-granduncle, Ptolemy VIII, was known as Fiscon, or Potbelly. He was morbidly obese, with bulging eyes and limbs so weak he had to be carried. Her father was described as physically soft and lethargic. These aren't just character flaws. They are classic symptoms of multi-organ fibrotic conditions and, specifically, Graves' disease. Graves' disease is an autoimmune disorder that attacks the thyroid. It causes a goiter, a swelling of the neck, and exophthalmos, or bulging eyes. But most importantly, it floods the body with thyroid hormones. This changes everything we know about her personality. Historians praise Cleopatra for her boundless energy and her ability to work through the night. We call it genius. A doctor might call it a thyroid storm. The manic energy, the rapid speech, the high stakes risk taking, the paranoia. These are the clinical markers of a body in a state of hyper stimulation. She wasn't just driven, she was chemically burning from the inside out. Now look at her face on the coins minted during her reign. We see a hooked nose, a jutting chin, and a thick neck. For centuries, we thought this was just an artistic style. But if you overlay a medical diagnosis, that thick neck looks suspiciously like a goiter. That jutting chin looks like the early stages of the mandibular deformity that destroyed the Habsburgs. And her famous petite frame, Plutarch wrote that she was small enough to be carried in a linen laundry sack on the back of a single servant. In a family line plagued by obesity, her small size might not have been natural. It may have been growth restriction caused by metabolic chaos. So how did she survive? How did she rule an empire when her genetics were trying to kill her? This leads to the final and perhaps most fascinating theory. Cleopatra wasn't just a queen, she was a biohacker. We know she wrote a book on cosmetics and poisons. Ancient texts reference her deep knowledge of compounds. History frames this as vanity or assassination prep, but look at it through the lens of chronic pain. If she inherited the joint agony and bone weakness of the Ptolemies, she needed relief. Egypt was the pharmaceutical capital of the ancient world. She had access to the finest opium from Thebes. She likely used it not to get high, but to be able to stand for hours during diplomatic receptions. If she suffered from the insomnia and tremors of Graves' disease, she likely utilized kaifi, a medicinal temple incense known for its heavy sedative properties. And the blue lotus wine she was famous for drinking, it induces a state of mild euphoria and dissociation. Her legendary charisma might have been a carefully calibrated cocktail of adrenaline from her thyroid and sedatives from her pharmacy, keeping her floating above the pain of a failing body. She wasn't a goddess effortlessly ruling the Nile. She was a scientist fighting a war against her own biology, painting a mask over her symptoms so that Rome would see a monarch instead of a medical patient. She even tried to fix the timeline. Why did she have children with Caesar and Mark Antony, but none with her two brother husbands? Because she knew. She saw the monsters in her family tree, the deformities, the madness, and she refused to let that happen to her offspring. She brought in Roman DNA to break the loop. She was trying to breed the sickness out of her dynasty. This brings us back to the tunnel at Taposiris Magna. Kathleen Martinez is inching closer to the tomb every day. If she breaks the final seal, we won't just find gold and jewels. We will find the truth written in bone. We might find a woman who was frail, ravaged by inbreeding, perhaps hiding a goiter behind a golden collar. Finding Cleopatra won't just rewrite history, it will rewrite the biology of power. It will force us to ask, was she the genetic miracle who escaped the curse? Or was she the silent sufferer who ruled in spite of it? The tunnel is waiting. The DNA sequencers are ready. The the only thing left is to open the door. If you want to stay updated on this discovery and explore more mysteries of the ancient world, make sure you're subscribed. The truth is often buried deeper than we think.